The objectives for this lecture are twofold to primarily focus on providing a research-based tool for mapping stakeholders, but also to focus on the process implications. So this is where we s left off last time, trying to figure out where to start with issues management. If issues management is about anticipating stakeholder interests and needs, then an organization should begin by understanding who its stakeholders are and what their relationship to the organization is. So our primary perspective objective is to provide you an understanding of an organization's stakeholders. It's a research-based process, but also a dynamic one, because stakeholders change, relationships with groups change, and situations change. But it gives an organization a place to start and a snapshot at any given point in time. I want to offer a heuristic to help us better understand organizational environments from the stakeholder perspective. That is, if we map stakeholders or those groups with an interest in our organization's actions, we can better understand the complexity of the organization's environment as well as the risks posed by the environment and changes within it. The model relies on understanding organizations f using a few well-researched concepts, power, legitimacy, relational history, and relational valence. Key authors on this are listed at the end with the additional resources. But an organization begins by listing all of its stakeholders that it knows about. This means due diligence in trying to identify as many stakeholders, both that the organization regularly deals with and not. This is a good starting point for issues management because instead of going aimlessly wandering through current events and the like, it lets organizations be more systematic in how they approach issues management programs. Not surprisingly then, we begin with power. There are a lot of ways to think about power from mutual respect to a Machiavellian framework. However, most of the research on power in an organizational context focuses on direct influence. That is, a stakeholder can be thought of as powerful if it can impose its will in a couple of primary ways. First, the stakeholder can impose its will in the relationship through coercion. This can be legal coercion, consumer activism, and the like. For example, in the United States, several Fox News presenters have lost their jobs over the years because consumers targeted the advertisers on their shows to pressure them to withdraw their advertising dollars from these controversial shows, and it worked. Alternatively, when IKEA considers opening stores and factories in new geographic locations, they often have a set of very specific demands on local authorities, business associations, and so on. These demands align with their corporate values. For example, in the negotiation of opening stores in some locations in Southeast Asia, IKEA has demanded improved infrastructure and wages, not just for their own employees, but for anyone doing work related to IKEA. And they've also asked for a few other things related to sustainability and employee conditions. Yet because of the financial value they represent, authorities have said yes. Second, the stakeholder can impose its will through utilitarian or practical means. That is to say that pleasing the stakeholder offers mutual advantage to the stakeholder as well as the organization. For example, many companies form strategic alliances with nonprofit organizations or charities because the charity gets the needed money and the firm's reputation can be positively affected. Both win. However, being in that relationship can also mean that bo both organizations can influence the others because they are joined by mutual interest. So as you begin to categorize an organization's stakeholders, the first question to ask is whether or not they can impose their will directly in the organization. Second, from the firm's perspective, we ask whether the stakeholders can be viewed as legitimate. Broadly speaking, legitimacy is about having socially accepted and expected structures or behaviors. In this case, when we talk about legitimacy, we're thinking about this from the organization's perspective. So does the organization like the nature of the claims that a group has on them? For example, some companies view taxes as completely legitimate and appropriate. However, others view taxes as illegitimate. So it is genuinely about the social and cultural values from the organization's perspective. 
in many cases, questions of different stake, different perceptions of what's legitimate in the organization's eyes compared to their stakeholder perspectives is exactly where the issues emerge. It's important that you don't confuse whether a stakeholder's interests in the organization are viewed as legitimate uh, with whether the organization really likes them or not. There are many groups and people whose interests are legitimate, but we may not like for any number of reasons. For example, I really dislike all things Apple and Mac. There is nothing, I, anything in my house. And, and that's the case for a host of reasons. However, that doesn't mean that I don't recognize the legitimacy of the technology and platforms as ones that are popular and in many cases, nice gadgets and devices. In a nutshell, that's really the distinction between legitimacy and liking. So now we have four quadrants that begin to emerge, but we're not finished yet. Third, organizations like people have relationship baggage and different levels of knowing and understanding the stakeholders that are connected to them. Think about your presence on social media. For me, I use social media very differently depending on the platform. Facebook for me is much more personal. My rule of th thumb is that my Facebook friends are actually people I've met in person and, and they're generally more people I would consider friends. However, that's not to say that all of my Facebook connections are equally close. A good portion of them are people that I went to school with, in some cases 30 years ago or more, moments when you do feel painfully old, by the way. Some are friendly work colleagues, some are my family, and some are my very closest friends, and about everything in between. So if I were charting my Facebook friends, all of them would be on the positive side of known. However, that's very different compared to my Twitter use or LinkedIn use. While I have these types of people on both, as both Twitter followers and LinkedIn connections, I also have people on both of those platforms that I don't know personally. I can identify them, but I really don't have a relationship with them, but they're still known to me. Also, because I have some articles, books, and website, and book chapters published, I've done consultancy work and all that kind of stuff. There are likely people out there who are familiar with me, and I don't have a foggy idea who they are. I can't identify them, but they perceive a connection, even if, let's be honest here, it's really minor and not life-changing. But this is the group that I'm talking about on the bottom side of this line. Organizations will always have stakeholders, people or groups affected by them or who perceive a connection that they know nothing about. Most of the time we think of this as the general public because we just don't have another box to put them in. Fourth and finally, we ask the question of whether or not the organization actually likes the stakeholder. So this is where we come back to the legitimacy versus liking distinction that I made earlier. Valence is about whether an organization likes the stakeholders or not. Those that organizations like are those that they would prefer to build, manage, and repair relationships with. And so those are going to be the most favored stakeholders. That said, there's the old adage that sometimes we keep our friends close, but our enemies closer. It's not that organizations ignore stakeholders they don't necessarily like. Those can be really important stakeholders. For example, in the oil and gas industry, environmental advocates are probably not the first group that's viewed as one the industry would necessarily like. However, there are an increasing number of projects and partnerships that occur are occurring between them for a host of reasons, mutual influence to genuine interest. So let me bring this back to my Mac example from the legitimacy discussion. I really dislike Macs, but because of the work I've done in graphic design, I've long been familiar with them and used them because for a lot of years they were the industry standard. That still doesn't mean I like them. Um, and as soon as I could, I could, I made sure that I didn't have to use them. That's a lot of the dynamic that you think about in terms of relational valence. So if we take these four factors together, we end up with a way to begin thinking about stakeholders and ultimately four categories of stakeholders. But it's probably helpful to actually think of an example. So let's use Coca-Cola as an example of an organization and discuss each of the categories of stakeholders. 
Let's begin with the first category, strategic stakeholders. These have legitimacy, power, a relational history, but they may not necessarily be liked. But regardless of whether the organization likes them or not, they know that they need to work with them. Certainly in the context of issues management, these are groups that will be monitored along with issues that affect strategic stakeholders. So back to our Coca-Cola Coca example, globally, strategic stakeholders would certainly include groups like consumers, employees, the media. But what about stakeholders that they may not like? It could be water conservancy groups, for example, in India where Coke manufacturing plants are. Second, suppliers. Um, Coca-Cola has had issues with a number of South, Central and South American labor organizations. Governments with different regulations, competitors. These can also be strategic stakeholder groups, regardless of whether Coca-Cola likes them or not, but they have to manage their relationships with all of them, regardless of whether they like them. Now let's take a look at the second category, desirable stakeholders. These are stakeholders that the organization likes, believes has a legitimate interest in the organization, and might even have direct relational history with, but they are stakeholders who lack direct power over the organization. In issues management, identifying what desirable stakeholders care about and that an organization is able to affect is a strategic opportunity for organizations. However, on the under, other side, understanding threats based on desirable stakeholder interests is also critical for preempting potential reputational crises. So why might an organization want to develop a relationship with stakeholders that have no direct power? In a nutshell, a lot of times it comes down to reputation and corporate social responsibility or corporate ethics. So let's come back to our Coca-Cola example. Coke has a three-part CSR objective heading to 2020. It focuses on women, water, and well-being. And Coca-Cola spends about $2 billion uh, worldwide in social responsibility initiatives. With women, for example, they have the Women's Entrepreneurial Program in more than 40 countries, largely developing nations. With water, they have water conservation programs working to be globally water neutral in their factories, developing clean water supplies and water supply reclamation in polluted areas. And well-being, they try to provide healthy options and developing goals to help consumers make healthy lifestyle choices. So in Coca-Cola's CSR objectives, they've identified groups that can be affected by them or that they're generally interested in and targeted them as ways to demonstrate that they're a responsible organization. Now, whether we think they're successful or genuine in doing this is a bit of a different conversation for a different day. But in many cases, groups targeted by companies for CSR initiatives can be viewed as desirable stakeholders. So for the mapping organization, who is it that the organization would really like to please, but doesn't necessarily have to? Third, moral stakeholders are typically stakeholders that the company doesn't know about specifically. Think about them for any organization, like I said before, as the general public. What's important about moral stakeholders is that they believe they have a connection to the company, whether or not the organization is aware they exist as a specific defined entity. So why might it be good to communicate with a general population through, say, advertising, identifying new stakeholders, generating goodwill, also building networks of relationship? This is also a major source of intelligence for issues management, in particular social media trends. Social media is an ideal environment for monitoring issues that are relevant to the public and so to the organization. So identifying what's trending and trying to develop relationships based on that, or at least to minimize the risk, is a critical component in issues management. In fact, the proportion of moral stakeholders in an internet age has considerably shrunk. Because of analytics, social media engagement and the like, a lot of people who used to be moral stakeholders can actually now be moved into different categories, most often desirable stakeholders. However, 
this still remains an important group because if the key litmus test is whether the organization can identify them specifically or not, there will always be stakeholders that the organization simply hasn't seen yet. So why focus on them? Aside from being an ethical organization, the question of these stakeholders' networks is an important one. They may not have power, but the groups or people that they may be connected to certainly could. In a practical sense, it's not so much about identifying the specific moral stakeholders, but the issues related to advertising goodwill and networks that could affect the organization. Finally, is probably the most fun group, the dangerous stakeholders. These groups have power, but are most definitely not liked by the organization and not always viewed as legitimate. However, the organization may also not know about the groups that could have direct power over them. So this is the one that's key for issues management, identifying groups and issues that the organization doesn't know about but could affect them directly is about directly minimizing the risk that the organization has by managing the issues that are important to dangerous stakeholders and definitely preventing them from emerging as crises. So what are some examples of dangerous stakeholders for Coca-Cola? It could be that it's government, it could be human rights advocacy groups, labor groups, or environmental groups. But the point is, that they meet these qualifications, yet they're really important to manage in terms of the issues and the relationships because of the power component. As I said earlier, this is an analytic exercise that gives an organization really a strong starting point in the issues management process, but it's a snapshot. One of the critical mistakes that an organization could commit was to analyze their stakeholders once using this process and then never update it. Organizations that are serious about their issues management process continually monitor both the issues as well as the stakeholders. So as we come back to the issues management process that we talked about before, hopefully it becomes more clear why it is that stakeholders are at the center of this process that it is the interaction and intersection of organizations, issues that affect them, and the stakeholders themselves that represents most of what we do in the field of public relations. The relationship that an organization manages with issues, as well as its stakeholders, ends up being one of the biggest predictors of the organization's success. This, too, is something that public relations offers organizations that is distinctive from other corporate communications functions like advertising, marketing, and sales. Because we're focused on the relationships, that means we're well positioned to take data or information from a lot of different sources, analyze it, and start to put the pieces together. That is to say, the field of public relations should appeal to people who like puzzles and putting them together. But this also means that we have to be more connected to research and theory in order to give us ideas and directions to go with our analysis than probably any of the other corporate communication functional areas. For more information on these topics and the grounding for this heuristic, take a look and at these sources as a starting point.